the Beyond Sleep Training Podcast, a podcast dedicated to sharing real tales of how people have managed sleep in their family outside of sleep training culture. Because sleep looks different with a baby in the house. And because every family is different, there is no one size fits all approach to take. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is being recorded, the Kalkadoon people. I pay my respects to the elders of this nation and the many other nations our guests reside in from the past, present and emerging. We honour Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, water and seas, as well as their rich contributions to society, including the birthing and nurturing of children. Welcome back to the Beyond Sleep Training Podcast. I'm your host, Carly Grubb, and with me today again is Bashi Kumar Hazard. Bashi joined us on last week's episode where we got to hear a little bit about how life looked when she welcomed her first baby, also how life would have looked if she was actually mothering her babes uh, where a large part of her family is in Malaysia. And then we also heard about welcoming her second baby who turns out had extensive health issues that went undiagnosed for a very long time. And Bashi actually credits co-sleeping with potentially saving her life around those. So welcome back, Bashi. Thank you for having me again. Pleasure to be here. Now, for anyone who hasn't listened to that episode, I'd strongly encourage you to go back and have a listen because it will make a whole lot more sense for what we're about to talk about today. So when we finished that episode, Bashi, we just heard that your little girl had had her tonsils and adenoids out and grommets in as well mm-hmm. as blue ear resolved. And you said that, that like her recovery was almost instantaneous. What did you notice at that time? Oh, so I think the first thing that was most, uh, the probably most remarkable thing. So, you know, we, we met with the surgeon afterwards and, you know, he said, look, we've done all of these things, but I think she's going to have, um, speech therapy and she's going to need, you know, we need to get her hearing checked anyway. Um, she was in recovery and then about Five hours later, it was middle of the night, and I remember she woke up and she was starving because they, you know, made her not eat for at least 12 hours. Um, And I whispered to my husband, I said, I said we could give her a biscuit. And she said, as clear as a bell, biscuit. And both of us almost fell off our chair because we realised then that we hadn't heard her voice for a very long time. Oh, so, I know. And you know, there was there was no like there was no stopping her after that. So I, within a month, she immediately within a week started sitting up. The vomiting stopped. She was eating, you know, like volumes. I think she was trying very much to catch up. Within about three months, her weight had restored, but more. Um, significantly for us she sat up about you know a week into it uh she was crawling within 10 days um and she was walking within three months and I would distinctly remember this you know I know I was cooking dinner and she comes into the kitchen she crawls in she then stands up because the music is on. I'll put music on, you know, in the evenings while I'm doing dinner just to keep them distracted. By this time I've got like a five-year-old racing around and her. And um, and uh, she comes in and she stands up and she doesn't just stand up. She starts dancing. So she swings. Oh, oh it was just the most gorgeous thing, you know. She's like just naked except for a nappy and she's just kind of having a little bit of a swing on those legs and oh. she knew it too she was so proud of herself it was oh, so that's, beautiful. that is just precious beautiful yeah, yeah. so how, how old was she when she had the surgery she would have been just on 18 months yeah wow and so she yeah. commenced crawling like sitting up crawling and whatnot in that window from the 18 to 24 months oh my gosh yeah. bashy yes yes what and a relief and yeah yeah, all of that. And it turned out, you know, her hearing was really very good. So we didn't have to worry about anything other than the grommets and keeping her, you know, out of water and checking, keeping a check on the ears so they weren't prone to infection and stuff. But yeah, she just went from strength to strength after that. Yeah. 
That it's is amazing. amazing. It's, yeah. Oh, and I didn't truly let, is. I, she didn't want to leave our bed and nor did we make her. She kind of decided, you know, that she was fiercely independent and wanted to because the, the kids were in the same room and she wanted to be back with her older brother, which was great actually because he was getting to the point where he probably was going to have his own room. But they managed to, she managed to get two years out of him and they really bonded through that. It was fantastic, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And so like her sleep improved instantly with the surgery as well? Instantly. So, you know, not only was she sleeping, so she did a lot of catching up. She did a lot of like, and I think we both did, to be honest, because my stress levels, you know, it took me a while to, because I was constantly checking on her through the night. You know, you, every time you turn, you're like, is she okay? Is she okay? You're hypervigilant to the max. Yeah, you are. You are. And, you know, you just want to make sure that you don't miss a thing, like in terms of her distress or whatever it is. But funnily enough, as I said, when she was lying next to me with her mouth all always half open, you know, ready to latch onto that boob. The, the, she slept well, you know, and her temperature was really well regulated. So I think I, even after the surgery, I just kept her with me. And then about probably about a year, year and a half later, she sort of went, I'm moving on now. <laughs> and and left. Right. Yeah, Wait. except I love having them. <laughs> oh, I know. bet you do. But it would have been like you probably both needed that recovery time because there would have been like in, in terms of night night feeds and things like that, I'm imagining she still would have really benefited from that nutritional boost while she was regaining all of her strength and whatnot as well. Absolutely. So, again, I did the same thing. I let the kids, she weaned when she was ready and she would have been about sort of three, just over three. So she got a good... 18 months from me and probably made up for all the time she you know, threw up that breast milk. But it was, I have to say, the surgeon said this to me as well. He said, uh, you know, after the surgery, he said, look, I have no doubt that you continuing to breastfeed her through all of that saved her life because, as we know, the breast milk digests faster, right? The food sits there, but the breast milk just goes through and is really easily digested and would have been, you know, gone through and into her before she had a chance to throw it up. So he he more or less was saying, yeah, he was also saying you kept her throat open with the breastfeeding and, and encouraged her to swallow. So these were all things that were essentially keeping her alive. Oh, Bashi, that's amazing. And it's something that like I guess is not necessarily people would credit with it, but it makes a whole lot of sense physiologically that having her in that proximity with you, the positioning and, and the very nature of the breast milk, that that would actually be assisting her all through that really torrid time in her life. It was, yeah. And she, you know, she's so precious to us. And just that I, and I feel this for moms. I feel when they, you know, your baby's sick and you're going through the system and nobody realizes the absolute personal hell you're going through, you know, where, and we do have this tendency because women are so isolated and alone, the enormous amount of pressure we put on them. So, you know, there's no community rallying around them. So when we go and seek help or get these access to services there's an element of blame that always creeps in you're not doing enough you didn't do this why didn't you do that this is this is a chart which follows a pattern of normal you know your baby should be at this stage your baby should be weaned your baby shouldn't be you know on this bottle or that bottle or this weaning cup Honestly, we just need to get over it. I don't know. I always said to, you know, women who are like, oh, the nurse told me to, you know, take get him off the bottle and I'd say, I don't know any 18-year-old that's still on a bottle. So whatever, you know, let it yeah. go. Let it go. And don't put yourself up over it. it. It's practical or real life too, isn't it? It's like it's all the ideals in the world, but then there's real life and it's okay to have your real life not represent whatever that bit of perfection you're supposedly meant to strive for. Not that it exists anyway. And there's no, in fact, the evidence is exactly the opposite. At the first five years of a child's life, you love them. You know, the boundaries you set are so gentle. Basically, it's like, you know, don't clobber your little brother, um, you know, or, um, you know, maybe even like I think, if you're lucky, you can convince them to sit at the table for long enough, you know, to 
pretend to have a meal. And even if they don't, like at least they sat at the table, you know, there's all these gentle things that you do, which is really kind of infused with love. And there's so much science now to show that that bonding period makes for healthy, stable, adjusted adults who are capable of loving, who are capable of forming their own families, who show that same love and patience and endurance to little people and little animals and their colleagues and their employees. We need a lot more of that. There's no evidence that, you know, controlling, organizing, you know, being authoritative over young children actually helps them. They don't learn anything except fear and aversion. That's not healthy adulthood. It absolutely isn't. And it's, it generally comes from a place of fear. And as we know, anything coming from a place of fear generally isn't the most um, healthy way to be as a human. So I think that's really wise words as well. Now I'm curious, your little love, she obviously came well. And at what point did you welcome your third babe to the fold? Okay, so Connor was really our surprise baby. After we had and we, you know, our daughter Akasha was on the mend, about six months after that my husband was ready, he could take a sabbatical. And I had by this time actually resigned from my job because they were harassing me while she was sick to come back to work and I said no. You know, there's only one thing that's really important. Your entire being becomes dedicated to supporting a sick child and so I couldn't think of anything else and it was fine with me at the time so when he had this sabbatical opportunity we decided that we would take our two little troopers who by now were like you know little adventurers and we would go on a a round trip so we went to Malaysia we went to Thailand we went to I think we went to Hong Kong we went to the border of China and we came back around again And they were amazing, you know, three and six-year-olds. They really were just extraordinary. And we had such a good time. And then uh, six weeks after I came back, I was pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. Surprise. (laughs) Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Oh, my goodness. Um, And Connor proved to be the greatest challenge pregnancy-wise. He, you know... Throw out the role, the rule book. And by this point, I would say I vomited furiously until he was born. Um, yep. You know, every 45 minutes, half an hour to 45 oh, wow. minutes, she, she was throwing up. Did you yeah, have that? Did you have any morning sickness with your first two babes? Cause obviously this isn't just morning sickness, but did you have like a, did you think I this have- could happen? It got progressively worse. So it was about five months for the first one, and then I felt amazing. It would have been about six to seven months with Akasha, and then I, I do. I, I recover and I feel amazing. Um, but with Connor, it just never left. And so I think I – so by the time he was about 4.1 kilos when he was born, and – You're tiny. I know. I know Where I'm did you put that four. baby? <laughs> oh, I can barely stand up. And just to give you an idea, I never gained a kilo through the pregnancy. So he was the <sighs> sum total of me. Yeah, it got to the point where he, the, the week before he was born, uh, if I kneel down to pick up Lego or whatever it was, I had to basically crawl to the wall and use it to get myself back <laughs> up again. <laughs> that's what it was like yeah yeah and I was dealing with the other two by just carrying them on my back and just doing it that way it was it was just oh mate that's impressive that you were still able to get down on the floor and carry toddlers on your back when you had holy moly mate that's strong (laughs) <laughs> to be honest, I don't quite know. You just do it, though. You know, I honestly, looking back now, think uh, I, I think that you know, women in Australia have children and go through and pregnancy. I think we're superhuman. To be honest, we put up with so much. Um, so yeah, Connor, and even from the moment he was born, Connor had his own plans. He knew what he wanted and went. So he fed whenever he slept whenever he just did what he wanted. And even the weaning, like he, you know, he's just sitting there and I had all these plans to sort of feed him like, you know, a spoon feed him with like, you know, pear sauce or apple. I don't know what it was at the time. Um, 
And he looked over at his brother who was eating like, you know, some pieces of fish and a fresh salad. And he basically just reached over, gouged some of that, swallowed it whole because he was toothless. <laughs> and we were all like, oh my God, he's got, and you know what? That was it. He never, he just refused, you know, soft food. He just, he just lived off that. Yeah. It's so funny, isn't it? When they decide yeah. like uh, my, my babe's, we're all big eaters, but I still remember my third baby just bouncing on my knee and just reaching for my plate and going, just chowing down. I, I can't even remember what it was on my plate, but I hadn't even factored in. Like, I think it was just mid conversation. It's like, Oh, hang on a sec. So we've started solids then. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it was like. And you know, by the next day that all that sort of, you know, you prepare, like you're getting ready for the weaning process. And I prepared this stuff and I just looked at it and I thought, it's never going to happen. I just threw it all out. <laughs> and how much easier is it though, when they just like oh. eat what everyone else eats? It's so much easier. And he was adamant, like, and even today, you know, this thing, like he's just big on salads because that's what he wanted. And, you know, the more colourful it is, the more exciting it is. And, um, and you know, the, I think the most fascinating thing for me is like we used to really finely slice like slivers of lamb and, and steak. And he did, he only had one tooth and he'd, he'd swallow it like a lizard and it became like this family joke. Like we'd all sit there just going, what is he? Oh, he's done. It. Oh my God! You know, <laughs> and it was so fascinating. Even to the other two, they were like they just thought he was, yeah, he was a force unto himself. And uh, I, with him too, by this time, I just slept with him from the day he was born. You know, we carved out a space. My husband was actually my husband was punted to the next bed, um, and I just stayed with him. And I I wouldn't let him out of my sight. I wasn't going to take, you know do that to any of my babies again never never um, and how did and did you think like did that help you with your fatigue levels and things like that like how did you feel yes. while you had him right there with you well by this time I was also very assertive as a mom so I said to my husband you know for the first six weeks you've got the other two and your home and I spent a lot of time just lying there and looking at him you know inspecting his toes and his fingers and he's you know it's really really a great time I fed him when he wanted to be fed and through the night he would just turn around and latch on he just did his thing and um he thrived I mean to be fair to he was 4.1 kilos and I was already so you know um skinny and so I needed the rest and I needed you know to in order to be able to keep up with feeding him um, and I needed to eat really well. And I, so, you know, this time around, I think we were clever enough to finally do the things for me personally that we should have always done. Um, instead of me trying to be brave and, you know, defy the odds, because all you're doing is borrowing from an empty vessel. You just, it's not there. You're, you're building a debt on your body and your physical and mental health that, it's very draining. I just honestly find, and I think if, if we all knew just how different it was in other cultures, we probably would all just go on strike. As yeah, men. I think so. I think so too. And I think it's also important because I think almost in my head, I remember um, hearing about some of this stuff afterwards and I remember being so confused first time around because I'd heard of all these like things that might help you in the postpartum, but I kind of thought that's because that was the only intense time. And it's like, after that, your baby sleeps and whatnot. So it's almost like I thought I could put off my recovery until he was that bit older, not realizing that actually the baby's still going to be intense. But if you get your recovery right now, you're going to be able to better cope and deal with your growing baby and their needs. Um, yeah. You'll be well with yourself. That's it. And that's the thing. We're sold this belief that it's a race, that you just have to get from A to B, you know, and you'll be fine after that. Life will return to normal. It's not. It's a marathon. you got to pace yourself. You've got to be adequately hydrated. You know, you've got to be, you know, in the, in the right space with the right support network. You've got to have someone along there cheering you along. Like it's so essential for you to be able to keep going, you know, and the challenges keep presenting because I think the – 
you know, just when you think you've got it down pat in terms of a, you know, routine that works for them and for you, they get up and start running around and then you get even less sleep. I think I was the one who was most upset when um, my eldest Declan gave up his afternoon nap because I was pregnant with Akasha and all I wanted to do was have a nap. I put him in his sleeping bag and in the cot in next to me in my room and at one point I remember just like having one eye half open and I watched him swing himself over the cot in his sleeping bag slide down the rungs onto the ground and then shuffle out of my room to go play in the backyard (laughs) could not believe all of this in that sleeping bag Oh, what and a legend. He was. Once he figured out how to do it, there was no stopping him and I knew that was it. So much for afternoon naps. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> done. Done. Co- yeah. Done with cot also. Cot yeah. Go on. Well, exactly. Oh my gosh. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. I definitely grieved the end of naps. Um, like it was like something I had to let go. Like it usually made bedtime heaps easy. So, you know, there is a bit of a trade-off. But yeah. holy dooly, when you first realize that actually that doesn't happen forever. <gasps> it hurts. Oh, yeah. Boy, does it hurt, right? Especially when you're pregnant. When yeah. you're pregnant, it's a killer. It's, but that's it. Yeah. it. I so look forward. I remember I give him lunch and I'd be so looking forward to that little kip. Yeah, no, it went. No. Well, that's all. We we had to introduce the quiet time and usually it involved a movie because then I was able to just lay still. And, you know, it depended on the attention span and age and whatnot. But, you know, even if I got 15 minutes of sitting with my legs up, I needed it. I needed to have that quiet downtime. I couldn't keep going at toddler pace without that break. Yeah. Oh, I remember. This is a good story, actually. So I had to do this napping thing with Connor because by the time I was eight months into the pregnancy, I was so unwell. I was really like, you know, running out of energy. Um, and um, one day, same thing, I put a movie on and, the you know, the two of them were sitting there. So I had definitely the end. He would have been like five. So just before school and Akasha was sitting on me and she was about two and a half. And I must have done off because when I woke up they both had um like uh, sharpies and they had drawn pictures and flowers all over one side of me that you know they could get to because they were sitting on top of me so they just <laughs> kind of walked. and I got and I got up and I my husband came home and I didn't realize it you know it was all down my knee down my neck and and he was like what happened to you? And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, you're covered in drawings. Like you just, in, and you go away for a couple of Because it was a Sharpie. That's permanent marker for anyone listening along. <laughs> yeah. They weren't allowed so they to. No, yeah. so they they couldn't, they didn't find themselves some washable markers. They went and found yeah. the Sharpies of all things. Oh, Bashi, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> Right at the telephone drawer, you know, and just just drew stuff all. And Akasha, you know, she was doing butterflies and flowers, and um, and the level yeah. of passed out you must have been to not even <laughs> feel it. I love it. That is so wow. good. <laughs> Mummy really needed a nap. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So, and you know, after that, I, I was so resigned to it. I remember, like, you know, going to the shops and people just looking at me with, you know, these drawings coming down my face. And what can you do? It eventually <laughs> came off. It You're eventually. Like, hey, what? Have I got something on my face? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I love it so much. Now, I'm just I'm just thinking, one thing I haven't really asked you about is um, were your babes contact nappers during the day? Did they did you tend to have cuddles to sleep or were they more of independent sleepers during the day? Uh, no, always a bit of a snuggle before sleep. Um, and depending on, like, I was pretty good at anticipating, like, the tiredness. Um, after a while, I should say, like, you know, took at least six months. But 
you don't un, you you shouldn't underestimate that quiet time in a dim room because it does actually wind them down and you holding them winds them down more so a bit of singing you know and a bit of bouncing around a bit of rocking but also part of the ritual of going in there so I used to go in there humming and singing and I'd say oh let's make this room really nice and cool and dark and you draw the curtains and you're still chatting and stuff like that so that was actually not not hard to do at all because they're quite tired in the afternoons the the night time I found a bit harder even though we did the whole bath and settled down they love their book reading so much that it'll be like another one another one yeah. another one you know so we're like five books today mommy and I'll be like no three four no three <laughs> four and that would and eventually of course I'd do four because yeah, you yeah. know like books, right. you know. Yeah, no, and they're always, you know, good fun. I, I have to admit, I secretly love those books we had, but um, they loved it too. So we used to sit there together and do a lot of reading. That's yeah. beautiful. And so, yeah. as your babes got older, just for people listening along, um, how did bedtime shift and change? Like, do you still stay with your babes while they're going to sleep, or do they prefer that you leave now? Or how does that look as the as they got older? So by the time they were about um, eight or nine, they were happy with like a kiss and a hug and a cuddle. But bear in mind that we read to all of our kids and we still read to our 10-year-old until they're ready, like it's bedtime. So we would get climb into bed with them half an hour before, you know, the usual bedtime and read read and read so it's part of the ritual it's essential part of the ritual as far as they're concerned and I think we yeah about about 10 years of age maybe even 11 for my daughter because she loved the reading so much our eldest he started doing his own reading and that was sort of you know his thing so we put him to bed and he he said I want to read for my, by myself for half an hour so but that even that he was probably about year six and he was kind of getting more aware of the fact that you know we were like because we were also doing both of them so he let it go faster Akasha didn't really want to let it go till she got to year six as well and with Connor I don't know that yeah it'll I think it'll be at least another couple of years before he's ready to give that up to it's about an age where they sort of go I want to do my own reading so then it's like a hug. We still, I have to say, even with our 16-year-old who's actually just turned 17, bedtime involves like a little chat. Like we, I sit there and just check in with them. So it's like, how are you going? You know, do you have a good day? Or um, And I, sometimes I just go in there and give them a hug and good night, and they will start a conversation. And I can't tell you how important that is. It's like they've been, you know, worrying about something or thinking about something all day and then it's their last opportunity. Um, and this is the other thing that we underestimate, which is that, you know, that witching hour and unsettled period that they have before bedtime as children, it actually hits them again as teenagers. So, you know, they do, they, they, they like to sleep in, but they also like get quite kind of active at about, you know, eight, eight 30 at night. So it's a great time to sit and chat a really good time. One, it'll be some question that will be thrown at you, you know, like, um, you know, something about they've heard at school, some kids in trouble because, you know, they were caught with drugs in their pockets. What would we do in those situations? Really important conversations to have and to be ready for them. So I do that. And then I'm still very hands. I, I don't care if they don't want it. They get big hugs and kisses from me randomly, <laughs> randomly through the day. Yeah. Just demonstrating that love. I love the idea of that, especially I think that's like, you know, for people with their tiny babes at the moment, knowing that they're laying the groundwork for those those kind of conversations and openness in the relationship with their parent. Um, yeah. Right from infancy because you've been available for that all their lives. And that skin contact, don't ever let it go. Just always be normalized about it, you know. Just a random, you're walking past, reach over and give them a hug. My eldest is five foot ten now. 
And I am literally hugging him around his waist. I don't care. I was going to say, you'd be up to his belly button. <laughs> absolutely. And you know what? You now, you know, he loves it. Like he just, I'll say, Hannah, morning, darling, or whatever, have a good day. And he'll say, I love you, mom. And, you know, put his big arms around me. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love, I, I just, thing. honestly. That really warms my heart because, uh, you know, that you can see how quickly they grow. Mine are seven, nearly six and three. And like, I can just see already like the babiness is leaving them, but I just always hope that they still feel like they can have that connection with me. So I love hearing that you've got that with your big little people now. Yeah. And you know what? Never, like, even though they do this whole, I'm, I'm, you know, independent, you find ways. I mean, I think the book reading and the evenings and the chatting is, you know, but just also random sort of, you know, so it doesn't get in their way and it's not too intensive. You're just walking past and you go, I'll sometimes say, I kiss you and I'll just give them a kiss on the cheek. (laughs) Just keeping your connection going regardless. That's it. That's beautiful. Well, we're nearly up to our 30 minutes again. And so I'm wondering if you would have one more tip that you'd like to share with our listeners. So I think if there's one thing that got us through all of the ups and downs of, you know, raising our babies, it is that I always look at them through the lens of love always. So, you know, no matter how many tantrums we've been through, it's my job. I'm the one who has to forgive unconditionally. I'm the one who has to always look at them and give them that benefit of the doubt the rest of the world will never give them. It's my job and I take it very seriously and that would be my advice is always look at your children through the lens of love. Oh, Bashi, that is just perfect. And thank you so much for being an amazing guest and sharing your experience with your family and your three very unique little people and the dramas that you all went through to find your feet with your family. So thanks again for coming on the show, Bashi. It's an absolute pleasure, Carly. Loved it. Thank you. And I'll be sure to drop all of the links to Bashi's work that that she does on human rights in childbirth, the International Lawyers Network, and also her law firm, BW Law, into our show notes and the Facebook page links as well in case anybody wanted to get in contact with her. Thanks for your work in that area also, Bashi. It's hugely needed in the community and we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Take care. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. The information we discussed was just that, information only. It is not specific advice. If you take any action following something you've heard from our show today, it is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical, or any other advice. Please reach out to me if you do have any questions or if there's a topic you'd really like us to be covering. And if you know somebody who'd really benefit from listening to our podcast, please be sure to pass our name along. Also check out our free peer support group, the Beyond Sleep Training Project and our wonderful website, www.littlesparklers.org. If you'd like even more from the show, you can join us as a patron on Patreon and you can find a link for that in our show notes. If listening is not really your jam, we also make sure we put full episode transcripts on our Little Sparklers website for you to also enjoy and fully captioned YouTube videos as well on our Little Sparklers channel. So thanks again for listening today. We really enjoy bringing this